Yes, um, welcome to this climate session. Now, my name is Tadele from Madisaba University. I'm chairing this um, session, what you call the climate session. This is going to be a very interesting session from three angles. One, climate has become a global and a regional issue. Second, climate has increase, increasingly become a political agenda. Third, climate um, has become a global public good, as, as indicated by Pascal in this morning. Now, um, this session, um, Sima will take us through what has we learned the last 20 years about climate change. Now, Sima is a professor of economics at Princeton University. Without further ado, um, I invite Sima to in give us her insights and remarks. Sima, you have the floor. Uh, okay, thank you. Thank you, Tadewa. Yeah, thanks everyone. I know it's uh, been a long day, and but we'll try to. Get, we'll, we're all committed to being peppy in our talks, so I'm not going to be an optimist about about climate change. I'll warn you of that. So I'm going to uh, kind of do an overview, and then Ted and, and Robin, we we coordinated pretty well, I think. So you know, climate change. Uh, I, grad, I finished my PhD 20 years ago, so this 20-year time horizon is useful because when I think about what I learned in graduate school, that climate change wasn't on the map. If, even if I think about my job market paper, I, today I can see it through the lens of climate change, but I, I don't think I used the phrase climate change or global warming in it. And so I would argue this is you know, one of the topics that's grown the most in development economics over the last 20 years, just because our own sensibilities have gone from this is something in the future we should be worried about to climate change has arrived. And so this is my quick and dirty way of, of seeing if that's true. This is a, just a Google Scholar search. And the red line you could see this is a log scale, the number of papers written on climate change and development in economics or a proxy for economics has grown a lot. And you know that's partly because Google Scholar coverage has gotten better. So my numeraire here is corruption because that feels like a topic that was a big deal 20 years ago and a big deal today. And you can see, you know, 20 years ago, there were twice as many papers written on corruption. It's overtaken it, and I'm sure this is going to diverge even more. I don't know how many people in the room has, have written a paper about climate change, but I'm going to guess it's going to be you know, pretty close to 100% in, uh, in the end of your career. So I'm going to structure this as like a, you know, kind of an overview of what development economists have worked on and should work on, uh, and structure it in, around impacts of climate change, adaptation to climate change, and then mitigation. So in terms of you know, impacts, I think before, even 20 years ago, before folks in this room and people we cite had started writing papers, there were lots of reasons to expect climate change to be especially harmful to low and middle income countries and the global poor. It's hotter to start with and uh, higher temperatures is a, is a big component of climate change. You know, greater reliance on agriculture, which intuitively should have especially big effects uh, uh, of climate change people's health and their economic situation is more fragile to begin with, and then less resources, fewer resources to adapt. You know, where I think research has come in, and this was already discussed by Kelsey and others this morning, is you know, to, to, to use our tool of, of having good research designs and careful data analysis to estimate causal effects to, to quantify those impacts of climate change in developing countries. And I think this is, changed the nature of uh, w how we see those impacts and, I, and also led to updating about just how enormous those negative impacts are. And I think that's been important. You know, knowing the magnitude is important for making the global advocacy case for mitigating climate change and the need for transfers of money from rich to poor countries to address it. And then you know, understanding the specific damages is also really helpful for designing the, the adaptation policies that are needed. So, you know, as one uh, study I'll mention, and Ted's going to talk a lot more about his work in this area and other work on uh, quantifying the effects of, of the impacts of climate change. You know, one study that many of us know is by uh, Dell Jones and Olkin, and, you know, that showed, looked at high temperature events and showed that that reduced income per capita. You know, in their data, it's exclusively in poorer countries, but, you know, in general, there's just much larger effects in, in poorer countries. 
And I think an important point that that study highlights is it's not just about a, a one-year temperature anomaly. It's not just hurting income in that year. It's going to affect growth. And so that, when you think about, put that into models of the effects of climate change, that growth versus levels effect is enormously important. And you know, it, it's not just agricultural productivity. It affects uh, other sectors as well. It's going to affect industrial output, conflict, etc. And so just the range of outcomes that are negatively affected by climate change is, I think, uh, is, is, is more massive than at least my intuition would have been before this evidence came along. Uh, you know, in terms of the magnitude, the, this paper by Carlton and all, just quantifies the mortality effects of climate change. And again, larger in poorer countries for you know, a lot of the reasons that would be intuitive. But quantifying that is really important because policy in a lot of uh, countries is gonna be determined by what you think the social cost of carbon is. What are the aggregate effects of climate change? You know, in the US, it's on the order of $40, $45 as the overall total social cost of carbon. You know, they show that if you just think about the mortality effects, so ignore, morbidity, loss of economic productivity, et cetera, you already get close to that $40. You know, so the actual social cost of carbon, you know, this is a big research program to, to chip off all of those pieces and, and get at a total, but we know it's going to be enormous if this component is already so big. You know, we've also learned that recovery from natural disasters, it's not just about high temperature, it's more storms, more floods, natural disasters. And here I think, you know, if, Many of economists' intuition about rebound from destruction of physical capital comes from the research of Davis and Weinstein after World War II, where we think, okay, places rebound. They have natural advantages and they rebound. You know, this work by Saul Shang and Amir Gina shows that for tropical storms, we don't have that optimistic story of destruction, but relatively quick rebound, at least over the 20-year time horizon they look out to. It looks like Places aren't recovering. You know, these are most. This is worldwide data, but a lot of these storms are in low and middle income countries. There's uh, very persistent harm from these natural disasters. Okay, let, let me pivot to adaptation. And I would say, you know, impacts is probably the area where there's been the most work by economists, the most influential work for by economists. My guess is that's not going to be the area where we do the most work going forward. It's going to be about adaptation because climate change has arrived and we know it's going to harm people in many ways and it's, it's an important, you know, a, a dire policy agenda to figure out how do we help people uh, cushion against these damages. You know, so the, the trick of measuring adaptation is that you know, we haven't had, this is an unprecedented event of a very large permanent uh, change in climate. And so one of the innovations, one of the comparative advantages of economists is thinking of good natural experiments to approximate large permanent changes. And so this is, uh, you know, one really nice study is by Blakesley et al. that uses well failure, so not climactic change, but a, a technological uh, effect of a infrastructure failing. But in their context, they're looking at, in India, this is going to have a quite persistent effect on a household's access to water. Because the cost of building a new well is so prohibitive, if you've got bad luck and your well fails, you're going to have permanently less water. And they use that to look at what happens to households' well-being and their uh, ability to adapt to this new uh, at lower access to natural resources. And I think, you know, there are lots of findings in their study, but the one I want to highlight here is they find that some places, some households are able to adapt, but it's really exclusively in the more developed areas. So there's a lot on this slide, but you can look at the, the bottom part on income. And so the left column of numbers are the places that have lower below median levels of development, and you see there's a permanent loss of income in those areas. Whereas in the above median places, you see a much smaller drop in uh, on-farm income, but really what's happening is they're able to switch to off-farm income. And then, you know, in some ways this looks like it, it nudged people towards structural transformation, going that there were other sectors that they could move to, they had the resources, you know, we talked about migration as a way that people can adapt, but you know, a lot of those resources are the rich being able, the relatively rich being able to adapt. And so uh, this broader point that 
you know, within the countries we all study, the, the adaptation is going to have a lot of heterogeneity based on initial conditions is, is I think, probably quite generalizable. You know, there are also studies of, about, uh, that have added to what, uh, or, you know, helped us understand how policy, government policy, it could be non-governmental policy, interacts with adaptation, you know, either helping it or hindering it. John Colmer has a, a nice paper in India where he looks at high temperature anomalies and what, where agricultural productivity especially is hurt and so demand for labor goes down, there are lots of otherwise unemployed people, and he finds that the manufacturing sector can absorb a lot of that labor you know, if and only if there's labor market flexibility. So there are lots of, good, you know, lots of negative things about making it easy to fire workers, but one thing about being able to temporarily add and uh, shed workers is that might be valuable in a more volatile wor world, uh, and climate change, one of its effects, is going to have this second moment effect. Uh, Claire Balboni has a you know, an, uh, uh, nice paper thinking about sea level rise where you know, a decentralized planning of, of road building is not going to internalize the, uh, you know, not going to internalize a lot, but not going to internalize the future uh, effects of climate change and lead to overbuilding near roads relative to what would make sense if we had a longer horizon and thought about the effects of climate change. My colleague Alan Shaw has also thought about sea level rise and thinking about the risk of you know, moral hazard that government policy can create. We want the government to help us adapt, and so the city of Jakarta is building a seawall, you know, a seawall to protect against rising sea level. You know, at the same time, we would like private businesses, private individuals to be thinking about this and migrating inland, doing more of their investment inland. And so, you know, we would love if government action and individual actions were complements. In this case, there's a little bit of a substitution or a moral hazard uh, that occurs. The, you know, and, and thinking about the studies on adaptation, there are more than I, I uh, thought about, I mean, that I've listed, but, you know, the number is not huge. But I do think in development economics, we have a lot more to say about adaptation by porting some of our evidence from other contexts to think about climate change. And so, you know, probably a lot of the other sessions are going to have papers that, you know, that there's probably a way this is relevant in, uh, for climate change. You know, so Sam Bazzi and co-authors have thought about, have used a, a, an Indonesian policy to resettle people in, on other islands and nothing related to, to climate change. But, you know, they, they provide valuable information about what are the predictors of, you know, where should you resettle people and you know, an intuitive finding that the agroclimactic similarity of places is relevant. There are probably other factors that are going to predict, you know, where should we uh, resettle people to be most, so that they can be most successful. Mushfik's work with co-authors on barriers to temporary migration, you know, that's also going to be uh, more relevant in a world where people are going to be facing more shocks and needing to migrate. The, uh, Lorenzo's paper with Jack Will Willis is getting lots of shout outs today, but I just came across something recently where in Nigeria, uh, an NGO, a private company is using that insight to provide livestock insurance to pastoralists. So thinking about how with shortages of water, pastoralists who depend on livestock, that livestock has no water, they're dying, you know, and, and thinking about, okay, we want to insure them, but then using this insight about the timing of payment. Robin's going to talk about long run uh, follow on work they've done with the, what Oriana mentioned on the um, Brax graduation approach and thinking about that as a, as a social protection, uh, as a, how well it cushions people in light of climate shocks of, of floods. And I'm sure you know, there are many more, many people's research uh, you know, in, in hindsight has, has valuable insights on climate. You know, so we were also asked to talk about open questions, and I feel like I, you know, I, I'm underqualified to think about these open questions. I think it's just a huge issue, and you know, everything is on the table from this topic. You know, and many things we already have studied are just going to have uh, newfound importance. So, technology ad development and adoption. This is an active area of research. The challenges of getting people to adopt new technologies. They're going to need to adopt ne new technologies now, not just to unleash the upward spiral, but to you know, really prevent the downward spiral as conditions got, get worse, whether that's you know, heat, drought, salinity tolerant crops or, or other things. 
you know, I think facilitating and coordinating migration, that's a, you know, it's going to be a big, it's something that, you know, the Indonesian government aside, is ha there aren't many examples of, of that happening, but, you know, thinking about, it's, it feels a little bit like industrial policy. It's, I think, probably coordinated migration is going to make more sense than, than totally decentralized migration. You know, we talked a, a lot over the day about designing and deploying insurance or other financial services, strengthening the social safety net. And, uh, you know, as I think about this, just take coordinating migration or just, a, you know, a, a bigger and um, more effective social safety net, it's going to require state capacity. So there is, I don't know, you know, I guess there's a session on the last day on political economy, but the, the need for government capacity, strengthening government capacity, uh, seems more important than ever. Okay, so I'm going to talk now about mitigation, and so I guess I should have started by just making sure everybody was on the same page on language. So, you know, at, impacts are, impacts and adaptation have bleed together because when we measure impacts, it's net of some adaptation, but that's about, you know, you're getting the effects of climate change. How is that affecting you and what are you doing to lessen the effects of that? Now, mitigation is about reducing carbon emissions or, you know, the amount of carbon dioxide uh, in the atmosphere. And as Tadele said, you know, this is a, a, a global public good. So I'm going to mix a little bit about research and kind of, you know, I think, I guess how I think we should be thinking about mitigation activity in low and middle income countries. So it just as a matter of justice, you know, taking off my economist hat, it's, you know, crazy to expect low and middle income countries to pay for mitigation. So the world is probably not going to achieve uh, the, the reduction in emissions if we just focus on rich countries, but from an economic burden point of view, poor countries don't have the resources to, to mitigate. It would have really big trade-offs in terms of economic growth. But even leaving that aside, just in terms of who got us into this mess, you know, most of the emissions are from today's rich countries. So these numbers, people have different numbers from this, but you know, roughly the richest 10% of the world is responsible for a third of current emissions. And if we think about the stock, which is, you know, also reflects past emissions, it's an even larger share. And so, you know, if you ask my opinion, and I doubt many people in this room are going to disagree with this, you know, we rich countries should be bearing the costs of this. You know, but some of my research and recent thinking has been about the point that we can decouple that question of who pays from where we should be uh, investing in mitigation opportunities. And you know, I would love to see the budgets for mitigation increase a lot, but for any level of a budget, that money could probably go further if we located mitigation uh, activities more than is currently happening in low and middle income countries. And that's because for basic economic reasons, many of the lowest cost ways to reduce emissions are in poorer countries. You know, some of it is the low hanging fruit hasn't been adopted because there are credit constraint barriers or other technological barriers. A lot of it is just lower factor prices. If you need land and labor for a project, those factor prices are going to be uh, less expensive in, in poorer countries. And you know, there's also most of the world's infrastructure growth is going to be in today's poorer countries, and it's easier to build green than to retrofit in terms of a cost structure. Uh, and so, you know, for, for all of these reasons, if we, if we, it's the flip side of being a global public good and, you know, there's a free riding problem of who's going to solve it, the positive side of, of thinking about that is you can look around the world and shop for the, the cheapest ways to, to mitigate. So some of my research has been on thinking about protecting forests as one of those cheap options. You know, people are cutting forests uh, and they're doing it. It's that money is critically important to them to pay for their health bills, their school bills, et cetera, feed their families. But in global terms, the amount of money they're getting by selling a few trees or growing a, another hectare of, of agriculture is tiny. Uh, and so this is a case where, from a global point of view, if we thought of the amount of carbon damage, it's huge, and from the individual, much larger than the individual's income gain from cutting that down. And so it's really a matter of, you know, how do we uh, get that individual to internalize the externality? And, you know, and the, the way to internalize the externality isn't to say, you know, we should all be contributing to climate change. It's really through economic transfers. And so, you know, policy like banning deforestation in the spirit of trying to protect the environment or climate, you know, wouldn't make sense. You know, people are poor, and if they lost that income, they would be even poorer. And even just from an enforcement point of view, that's challenging. And so the policy that 
uh, you know, is widely used in uh, or in several low and middle income income countries is to flip that equation and not ban it or fine people, but to reward them. So it's a conditional cash transfer, payments for ecosystem services or payments for environmental services to protect the environment. And so this is a way where someone can voluntarily choose to protect their forest rather than cutting it down if that's a better economic deal for them. So by reveal preference, they should only do it if they're less poor as a result uh, and, and you achieve the goal of protecting forests sequestering carbon in a very inexpensive way. So, you know, this is a conditional cash transfer with a different name used in environmental circles. So, uh, with several co-authors, we did a randomized trial in 121 villages in western Uganda where we operated this program, or an NGO operated this program in the treatment villages and then the control villages was business as usual. You know, and, and the reason you you need evidence to know, is this really a good idea? Is that I can do the math and tell you that people are making less $20 a, a year from a hectare of forest and that carbon is worth you know, 10 times that amount. But you know, the challenge with all conditional cash transfers is that maybe everybody who signs up is the people who sign up are gonna be the people who would have conserved anyway. So there's a real challenge of inframarginality in programs like that. You know, there's also a challenge of what's called leakage or you know, people just shifting, preserving on the land they, you're paying them for and shifting it elsewhere. And so part of our goals were to you know, try to put some numbers on this to really know the net impacts. And what do we find? In the control villages over a two year period, 9% of the forest that was there standing at the beginning was gone by the end two years later. So that's a huge rate of forest loss. And in the treatment villages, we halved it. So the program had that rate of forest loss. It didn't make it to zero. It's a voluntary program. If people felt like they were gonna be worse off economically by signing up for the program and protecting their forests, they didn't have to participate. And that's good. You know, that's good if we're trying to balance people's economic well-being and, and forest protection. And, and, uh, you know, but it, this is a pretty big dent in this problem. And you know, it's funny, if you had asked me at the beginning of this project, we, the a cost benefit, what, uh, calculation wasn't a big thing, but if I think about like one of the maybe contributions of this paper was to just really take seriously trying to quantify the carbon benefits and, and compare them to the cost of this program. So, you know, with satellite data, you can measure the amount, the hectares of trees that are protected. We can convert that with some assumptions to the tons of CO2 that are sequestered, not permanently, but while the program is in place. And then we can use the social cost of carbon to think about what the benefits are. And we know how much the program costs. And you know, we've since updated the benefit cost ratio since we published the paper with a very conservative estimate. We've since measured longer run effects and you know, the benefits outweigh the cost by a factor of 15. And, you know, and you know, more importantly, or even if you don't like the 15, you, you, that depends on the social cost of carbon, but you don't need a social cost of carbon to, to be able to at least say, I can take most programs in the US that are po US policies to try to sequester carbon, reduce emissions, they're gonna be a factor of 15 lower than this. And so this is the arbitrage opportunity of, of doing more mitigation in developing countries. You know, in terms of open questions, you know, I think, and this is a little bit related to, you know, I guess you could put this in the plumbing category. I think at least what I've been thinking about are how can we optimize these programs both and, you know, kind of bring some of these insights to large government programs. Kelsey has worked on using auctions to elicit people's willingness to accept and make it more cost effective. Uh, Robin's going to talk about thinking about where you should prioritize conservation, thinking about the uh, economic benefits versus the, you know, the places that are most carbon intensive or ecologically sensitive. And I'll mention briefly some recent pilot work I've been doing on improving the contract design to reduce inframarginal payments. And I say this partly because I think there's like a lot of low hanging fruit around uh, poorly designed policies where some of our basic Econ 101 insights can be valuable. And honestly, I think the challenge is often like getting in the door and convincing people of some of our insights. So, most of the large PES programs around the world have a feature that makes no sense to an economist, which is they allow people to choose what subset of their forest to enroll. And so if I were offered this program and I wanted to cut one hectare, hectare and I own 20, I'd enroll the other 19, keep cutting on that one hectare and make some money by not changing my behavior. And that's indeed 
what anecdotally seems to happen in Mexico. And so uh, with two co-authors, we ran a, a pilot study in Chiapas where we just did something very simple. We, we, there's a convenient sample we use, which are people who had applied to the government program. So we know what subset of land or total land they uh, submitted to the government, but there was a budget cut, so they were rejected. And so we took those individuals, and half of them we offered the government program, or they could use that polygon they wanted. And then the other half, we said, if you want to enroll, you have to enroll all of your land. And we see that what, compared to that standard contract, when we say enroll all of your forest or none of your forest, we have four times the cost effectiveness. You know, like, some people don't comply. It's a tougher bar, so some people say no thanks. But if they do sign up, they're uh, there's n not this easy way to game the system by just enrolling the land you were, you were going to preserve anyway. So you get more people to say, okay, it's a higher bar, but it's still worthwhile to me, and you're forcing me to conserve, and, and fine, I'll do that. So this is just the data. When we look at the full property, it's, we see this reduction in the share of that forest that was deforested over this one-year period, and it's really driven by that polygon, because we know their total land and we know how much they want to enroll, we really see you know, in this part that people had left out, they were deforesting 30% of it in the status quo. And you know, we, we were able to reduce that to 16%. You know, why is it not 0%? It's because some people chose not to participate in the program. And I think there's a, you know, a lot of uh, more research to, to be done on kind of improving program designs in these ways. You know, I don't know where Chris Woodruff is. I think he's going to be happy I, I, I make this point. But, you know, I think a real tension, a real risk in talking about we should be doing mitigation in, in poorer countries is that we see this in FCDO. We see this in the World Bank. I've, you see it in USAID. There's, like, a real risk that people are, agencies are going to move their development um, budgets towards funding these projects. And, you know, funding mitigation projects, this is a global public good. Like, I'm benefiting as much as the Ugandan farmer is, maybe more in, because uh, I have a higher level of income from these projects. And so this isn't about helping, you know, this program is about helping the globe, not helping, uh, not reducing poverty in Uganda. And I like to show this with revisiting that data from that Uganda study of mine, where you, you can predict, you can use machine learning techniques and predict who is going to conserve anyway and who actually had to change their behavior to uh, meet the requirements. So the ones on the left are people who we predict weren't going to make a lot of income from their forest, which is another way of saying they weren't going to cut down their forest. And what the vertical axis here is their economic well-being. And they are better off economically. These are the people who just got like free money. They were going to conserve anyway. You gave them this program. You helped them. Then there's a different set of people who actually were going to make money on their forest. They're the ones you. They're the only ones you get conservation benefits from, and they have no economic improvement. They're not worse off. You know, it's voluntary. So by revealed preference, like they should have not signed up if if it was. Uh, going to hurt them, but you know this is there's no double counting. You know there's such a temptation to double count. I used to call PES a win-win. I now don't use this language because you know there is a win-win because of some co-benefits of water tables, etc. And some people were economically better off. But you, you know the people who had to change their behavior, lose their income from cutting trees, you know you're just making the, sure they're no worse off. You're not uh, helping them. So that's like just you know that's all my caveat, but I, I do think it's uh, it's you know something that everybody should be beating the drum on because I think many of us have seen this movement of aid agencies. You know, so what do I think some of the open research areas are? I do think you know measuring co-benefits, and it's not just from these nature-based solutions, but all sorts of solutions is important because you know how can things really be a win-win? You know, it could be a monetary transfer. We want to do a project in. You know, rich country wants to do a project in a low and middle income country. We're going to save this much money, you know, relative to funding our best option at home. We'll transfer money to you. Or the win-win the can come through some co-benefits that aren't climate related. So defor protecting forests has local benefits for tourism in Uganda, for uh, the water table, et cetera. You know, switching from coal to cleaner energy reduces particulate matter. You know, I think one of our roles to make sure that 
uh, you know, developing countries are truly benefiting from this is, is to think about these other co-benefits. You know, I think the uh, improving monitoring capability and credibility is important so you can actually capture these benefits. I think many of us are rightly skeptical of the carbon off voluntary carbon offset markets because you basically self-verify. And so for something like this to actually be a good use of money, you need uh, it, it to, to truly be credible. I think spurring innovation for appropriate technology, improving regulatory capacity, that's not just for climate, all sorts of environmental uh, harm in developing countries. I you know, always go back to realizing better regulatory capacity would be valuable. And then you know, I, I also think a lot of the uh, push to, to mitigate in developing countries, you know, to have a cleaner grid is going to have economic trade-offs. And so I think quantifying those trade-offs and, you know, rather than being Pollyannish about the win-wins is, is an, another important role for us as economists. Uh, so I'll, uh, let me skip this in the interest of time. It's just my, my go-to point to make, you know, there are often trade-offs when you add a constraint that you want to protect the environment. It, that's our Standard economic thinking says there should be trade-offs, and the evidence suggests there is. So, you know, I think climate change, we all know this, is going to be a huge challenge for low- and middle-income countries. There's too little money flowing to them for adaptation and too little pressure to, you know, bear some of the burden of, of mitigation. And so I, you know, uh, think it's going to be a critical area for development economics research over the next 20 years. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Sima, for this interesting insights about the uh, impacts of climate change and the costs, um, policy interventions, and also gaps. Now, next is the, this is time for discussants. Now we have Teddy Mukul uh, from the um, University of California at Berkeley. Now you have the floor. Uh, first of all, thanks to the organizers uh, for the event, to STIAS and the Nobel Foundation. It's really been a great day, uh, and it's such a pleasure uh, to be part of this. So I'm going to follow up on Seema's talk. She covered a lot of ground. I'm going to zoom in uh, a little bit on a couple specific topics. So this is going to be a little bit tighter, kind of narrower talk than some of the other ones um, today. Uh, and in particular, I'm going to focus on two key questions around which there's now really a lot of literature, and I'm going to try to help kind of walk through that literature, what we've learned, and also what, what some of the open questions are. The first is, what is the impact of climate and, by extension, climate change on economic growth? Big question, really a huge question for economic policy. Uh, and the second one is the impact of climate on violent conflict. And violent conflict has been measured in the literature and by social scientists in a number of different dimensions, everything from civil war to violent crime. And actually, in new work, even self-harm and suicide, another form of violence. So, you know, pretty broad definition of, of violence. I want to start, since the, the goal of the symposium is to kind of take us back, you know, what have we learned in the last 20 years, to what the literature looked like around 2000. What was the, the literature on the economics of climate? What was our best guess? as to what would happen, say, over the next 60 or 70 years due to climate change. And really, the leading voice and the leading work at that time um, was work by Nordhaus and, and colleagues of Nordhaus. These are integrated assessment models. They're really kind of very theory-driven models that link economic systems and physical systems and sort of model how CO2 emissions will affect warming and how that'll affect uh, economic growth. And the kind of uh, you know punchline of a lot of that work was that uh, over the coming decades, climate change was likely to have a pretty small effect on global GDP, maybe 2% in some of the DICE models, maybe 3%. Uh, and so what that means is, you know, let's say incomes were to have doubled out 60 years. Uh, instead of doubling, maybe they'll increase by 97 or 98%. So that was kind of the, you know, the, 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 the state of the art on some level around 2000. At the same time, there were kind of these countercurrents in the literature around the importance of temperature uh, and, uh, and climate. And so, uh, you know, the well-known work by Hall and Jones show that uh, countries near the equator are much poorer than countries farther from the equator. Or similar work by Bloom and Sachs, finding that tropical countries are much poorer than non-tropical countries. So on average, non-tropical countries' GDP per capita was four times that of tropical countries, just huge effects. Uh, 
But, you know, I think people in the literature acknowledged it was hard to interpret some of those findings. How much of that was due to temperature? How much of that was due to other aspects of geography or colonial history or other factors? So uh, there wasn't really a consensus on, on what impacts um, would be. And really since 2000, there's been an exploding scientific literature on these topics. Economists have taken the lead, but in recent years, there's actually a lot of climate scientists and political scientists and others who have really jumped into this literature. So what we've plotted here at right is just a figure from a, a literature re review that we did um, on some search terms on uh, climate and conflict, that literature. Uh, and this is part of a handbook chapter that I've been working on with co-authors. And you can see, you know, around 2000, there wasn't that much literature. It wasn't growing by much every year. After about 2005, 2008, there's just been this exploding literature. And it's similar for climate and economic growth. So there really is a massive literature now. We've learned a lot, and I want to get through uh, some of it today. I've listed a couple of survey articles um, in case you're interested in going into all the details on, on these papers. Again, there's, there's a, a, huge, a huge literature. The big scientific breakthrough, and this is related to what Seema alluded to and others in this session, is the use of causal inference methods to make progress on understanding impacts and really harnessing weather and climate variation as a natural experiment and you know, applying microeconometric tools to measure causal effects. That's really what happened around this time and has really helped to transform uh, the literature. And it's taken us away from the integrated assessment models, which were kind of based on outdated assumptions and you know, were, were kind of hard to, to uh, assess uh, into a much more empirical phase of the literature. So I'm gonna talk about four or five of the kind of influential early articles. I was very lucky to be part of one of the early articles in this uh, literature uh, with uh, Shankar Satyanath and Ernest Sergenti in a paper published uh, in 2004. Uh, and we do a couple things in this article that uh, are related to, you know, some of the contributions that I, I just mentioned. Um, so, you know, before this, this time, it was actually quite hard to look at regional or country level weather shocks in a lot of African countries and other low income countries because weather gauges and weather stations were often missing. Uh, they were often not operational. In conflict settings, it was impossible to get weather data. Kelsey alluded to similar things with pollution before. So it was very similar with weather data. So there had been use of weather variation to say understand the incomes of farm households or villages, but really it was very localized. So Christina Paxson and others had those kinds of more localized estimates. What we were able to do here is start using remote sensing data. That was really an important uh, part of the contribution, which gave us global coverage and allowed us to measure precipitation much more reliably and consistently uh, across countries. Uh, we combined that with a, a large sample, of over 40 African countries over multi, you know, two decades. Uh, and importantly, we adopted tools from applied uh, microeconometrics. Uh, we included country fixed effects to account for those fixed differences between different countries that had sort of plagued the interpretation of some of the earlier literature. We included time effects, uh, et cetera. So um, this specific paper had a certain uh, empirical approach. It was, there was actually an instrumental variable approach. The first stage relationship uh, was that first question that I talked about before. How does climate variation affect growth? We saw that as the first stage in an IV uh, regression, the, the reduced form was like question two. What was the effect of climate variation uh, on conflict? So we linked those together and, you know, uh, backed out in, in the two-stage uh, least squares what the effect of economic uh, on li living conditions on conflict. Now, it turns out in the subsequent literature, and Seema alluded to this, and I'm going to talk about some of this, it turns out high temperatures and precipitation affect a whole range of societal outcomes not just economic growth. So the kind of exclusion restriction assumption needed for that IV really isn't appropriate. That said, the first stage in reduced form in this analysis kind of set the stage for some of the subsequent uh, literature. So let me just show you like the kind of, these are just figures from that first paper. The panel on the left shows when rainfall is growing, economic growth tends to be higher in sub-Saharan African countries. Maybe not too much of a surprise given the dependence on rain-fed agriculture in many African countries in the 80s and 90s. The panel on the right shows that when rainfall is increasing, there tends to be less armed civil conflict. Uh, and you know, th th these were the, the kind of uh, fundamental empirical findings of that, uh, of that study. Okay, so there were several you know, different elements around this time in the literature, different econometric methods, different data, 
that allowed us to make progress. And there's really been an acceleration of research in this area uh, since then. So Seema alluded to the famous Dell, Jones, and Olkin paper, very important, influential study. I would say the Dell, Jones, and Olkin paper was really the first paper that forcefully, empirically made the case for just how large temperature effects could be on economic growth. And they focused on sort of longer lags to get at the persistence of temperature shocks on economic conditions and show that they were very meaningful. So some of the assumptions in the old integrated assessment models were, you know, really just temporary level effects of higher temperatures. But no, it actually turns out there's real persistence of higher temperatures. Uh, so that's a very important, uh, well-cited uh, study. In some of our subsequent work, we extended that, that work and focused on something a little different, which was the nonlinearity in the relationship between uh, temperature and growth. So it turns out if you start out at higher temperatures, every additional degree of Celsius of warming leads to more damage. And that's something that had been hypothesized, but that we, we focus on and show in, in this study. And I'll show you that figure um, in a second. The other thing we're able to do in that study is project out the impacts on future growth using some of the standard assumptions in this literature about what growth rates will look like in the coming decades. And those are kind of heroic, but there's a kind of range of different you know, growth numbers that are assumed you know, across countries. And th this model that allows for a nonlinearity predicts that global GDP to the end of century will be 23% lower with climate change than without climate change. So very different than that 3% or 2% number uh, from the earlier uh, Nordhaus and related uh, literature. Uh, I'll show you the figure in a second. I just want to mention one very you know, nice new paper here, the Noth, Ramey, and Clino, that combines some elements of the older literature in imposing more modeling assumptions on the process of economic growth, combined with these estimates of uh, the damage of higher temperature. Um, on economic growth and find large GDP losses to end of century, maybe not quite as large as Dell, Jones, and Olkin or some of our work, uh, but still, you know, multiples more than the earlier uh, literature. So I would say in terms of thinking of scientific consensus, what have we learned in 20 years? We've learned that the likely impact on future economic activity of climate change is just multiples larger than we thought it was. 20-something years ago. So um, this is, these are just a couple figures. The figure on the left shows this nonlinear relationship. What we have here is the marginal uh, impact on growth of a degree of warming at different base levels of temperature. So what you can see here is you know, a lot of the world's poor big countries, Indonesia, India, Nigeria, a lot of African countries are way over there on the right with high average temperatures. And in that range, every additional degree of warming is associated with big drops. Uh, in income. In contrast, there's a lot less sensitivity to temperature in the mean temperature range of a lot of the big economies in Europe, uh, North America, uh, et cetera. So just like Dell, Jones, and Olkin, it really looks like poor countries will be hit most. Um, the panel on the right is from a new study by some climate scientists that carry out a similar exercise for rainfall. So this is kind of similar to our 2004 paper. In general, globally, rising rainfall is associated with faster growth until you get to very high levels. And then maybe if there's flooding or excess rainfall, it's bad, uh, bad for growth. But there really is this kind of global nonlinear relationship. And the implications when you project forward uh, what will happen to GDP per capita over the coming decades are really striking. So the, the countries in red here are the countries that are predicted or projected to experience big drops uh, in income. You can see a lot of them in Sub-Saharan Africa, South Asia, et cetera. Whereas a lot of the northern richer countries, if anything, will experience some gains. They're on the other side of the curve. So actually getting a little warmer in northern Canada may be good for economic conditions, with the caveat that some of the more recent estimates are a bit less positive on the growth gains in Russia and Canada. They're still positive in some of the newest literature, but maybe not quite as large uh, as these here. All right. So put a pin in that, climate and growth Real emerging consensus, these impacts are large. Again, echoing Seema's point. The other literature on climate and conflict has also exploded. I showed you that, uh, no pun intended. Uh, I, you know, I've also showed you that plot of the number of studies. Um, there's so many studies here, I'm not going to go into them individually. But what we've been able to do is carry out meta-analyses across major categories of violence. Armed conflict is one. Interpersonal violence is another. Self-harm and suicide is another. So I've just showed you one of the meta-analysis plots here. This is for the organized 
intergroup violence, but there are similar ones for those other studies. And at this point, there's just scores and scores of high quality empirical studies that tell quite a consistent story in the meta-analysis estimates. There's predicted to be substantial increases in violence for every degree warming going forward. And so here it really depends on which estimate you focus on. There's something like a 2.5 to 5% increase in predicted violence for each one standard deviation increase in temperature in the coming decades. And that, that standard deviation is the interannual uh, variation. So, you know, what is that equivalent to? Well, global warming may lead to two to four standard deviations of warming. So you can multiply that by 2.5 to 5, and you're probably going to get double digit increases in the risk of civil conflict. Um, as a result. Okay, so just two last points on mechanisms and adaptation, which are probably things uh, you're thinking about as I, as I mention this. We've made a lot of progress in just the last few years in understanding mechanisms. I think in the early literature, it was a bit mysterious exactly what was going on. What were the channels? There were a lot of hypothesized channels. We've made progress. We've, not surprisingly perhaps, but, but it's great to show it, establish that agricultural shocks are really critical. So Eliana and co-author have a very nice paper documenting that it's not just high temperatures that tend to uh, lead to more conflict in a given area. It's high temperatures that occur in key crop growing seasons in that pixel. So it's very specific. Um, so there's something about agricultural productivity uh, that matters. Another study I want to highlight is the recent McGuirk and Nunn paper on herder um, farmer conflict in Africa, which is a, a beautiful paper, and finds again that economic shocks that tend to lead herders to encroach on farmers' land tend to be associated with more violence. So again, something that's been discussed anecdotally, we're now actually finding these, these mechanisms in the literature um, very robustly. Another point I want to emphasize is a new literature, and, and these uh, papers are uh, either recently published or they're still working papers on public policy, and this is important for adaptation. There are three studies out showing that large-scale social protection programs can reduce the sensitivity of uh, conflict to, to temperature shocks. So I've listed them there. Uh, the Fetzer shows that where the NREGA employment guarantee program got rolled out in India, there's less, less sensitivity of temperature shocks uh, in terms of leading to Naxalite rebel violence. The um, Garg et al. paper shows that when Progressa got rolled out in Mexico, there's less sensitivity of violent crime uh, when there's a high temperature shock. So again, it, it really flattens out. And then the final one, the Christian et al., shows that uh, the expansion of a cash transfer program in Indonesia reduced the sensitivity of suicide and self-harm to temperature. So really across these you know, various types of violence, uh, social protection programs can be quite effective. That said, it's not just economic factors that matter. There's more evidence that non-economic factors also matter. Psychological channels may matter. Crime goes up in a hot week in US cities, even though there's no clear economic mechanism linking uh, you know, a hot week in New York City to, uh, to crime. There's not an economic shock per se, but there's still more crime. So there's something physiological or psychological. And then there's some new lab work, and this is with Tessa, um, almost uh, et al, showing that there's more aggression in hot rooms in the lab uh, when we ran this lab in Nairobi, Kenya, uh, than in cool rooms. And so what we did is we ran the Joy of Destruction game, which allows players to anonymously and costlessly destroy the endowment of other people in the lab. In the hot room, people did it a lot more than in the cool room. So if we couldn't literally have violence in the lab that's unethical, we wouldn't do that. But there's something about aggression increasing that's important. So this is just my last uh, kind of slide of results, and I, I want to wrap up. Uh, if you remember one figure from this talk, remember this figure here. So this is from a new working paper by my co-authors. This is the, that same curved relationship I showed you before about the marginal effect of temperature at different base temperatures. And you see that inverted U shape, and you see how it dips down at high temperatures. The three lines there in the three colors show the sensitivity of growth to temperature in the 60s and 70s, in the 80s and 90s, and since 2000. Those lines lie exactly on top of each other. If there were adaptation, successful adaptation over time in the last few decades, we would see a lessening of that relationship. Basically, in the last 60 years, there's no empirical evidence of real adaptation to higher temperatures. And that's a concern. I have debates with my co-authors. I tend to be kind of optimistic. I'm like, maybe there'll be technological breakthroughs. Maybe the te next 10 years will be different than the last 60 years. 
Um, and we can hope for that. And maybe the world's attention is finally on climate change, but we haven't successfully adapted in the last 60 years. And as a result, if we look across you know, the region that inspired my early work, parts of Sub-Saharan Africa, the Sahel, we see a region with coups, this is a, something from the New York Times, coups in the last year kind of across the Sahel. We see conflict in Somalia, Ethiopia, northern Nigeria, South Sudan, uh, et cetera. We see a whole region, Lake Chad has dried up and disappeared. We see a whole region that's kind of experiencing the predictions that we had a, few, a couple decades ago, uh, unfortunately. So I think, you know, the urgent moment is now. And, uh, you know, we're already probably seeing the, the, the negative consequences of climate change on conflict. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Ted. Um, his remarks focus on two things. One is the impact of climate change on economic growth and also the impact of climate change on conflicts. Very interesting. Thank you very much for these insights. Next, um, I invite um, Robin uh, from the London School of um, Economics and Political Science. Uh, you have the floor. Thank you. OK, so usually at this point in the uh, proceedings, you say, um, I'm what stands between you and dinner. But I think in this case, I'm what stands between you and Abhijit and Esther. So the pressure is even higher. Um, so I'm going to try to sort of flip things around um, and ask this question about, you know, how is climate going to change development, which I think is important. Um, and there's two things that kind of recent things, or fairly recent things, that kind of push me in this direction. One is that about three weeks ago, I spent a week in Zambia uh, working with the president and others. And what came out, which was unexpected to me, is that the biggest thing they're concerned with was drought affecting vast amounts of the country and leading to many of, or wor worries that it would lead to many of the types of conflict that Ted was describing. Um, so I, you know, I, w I went to Zambia, started to hear about this, but I also heard other things like they have vast amounts of cobalt and copper and many other rare earths. And so the second big concern is how are we going to get the value chain into Zambia and get some benefits from those things? So that interested me. And then finally, they have amazing like national parks. And they were thinking a lot about these sort of payment for eco ecosystem services. So in all those three areas, which really were the priorities coming from them, not from me, it's pretty clear that climate and environment pervaded in a way that just wasn't the case when you visited countries like Zambia even 10 years ago. So that was one thing. And then the second thing is, Obviously, I'm at the LSE, so that's all I see. But I view the LSE a bit of a bellwether of what's happening in economics, and many of you have had associations with the LSE. Since 2021, we had three, maybe four students interested in environment and climate change in the economics department. We now have 25. So in three years, it's gone from three, four to 25. And the interesting thing about that is they're not all doing development. So many of them are coming from macro, they're coming from IO, they're coming from, from finance, they're coming from public. And I think that because they care about climate change, fundamentally care about climate change, in a way that's even stronger than the way that people used to care about poverty. And so I think we have to sort of think as development economists, well, how are these developments, which are clearly happening everywhere, going to affect our discipline and the economics discipline more broadly? So what I wanted to do is sort of do um, I'm not going to show you very many words, but I'm going to show you an inordinate number of uh, figures. But I think Seema has made the point, but I think it's worth reiterating that the kind of elephant in the room here is that all the emissions, to a large extent, came from the countries that are now rich. But the damage is, and this is another indication of how important climate change, the number of times we're going to show the Carlton et al. Uh, figure or some variant of it, um, but the damages are felt you know, more in the, in the lower income and lower middle income countries, and particularly where the poorest are, which is on the bottom graph. So this kind of introduces both a moral dimension of what are we going to do about this, but it also pushes us into areas where we're not very comfortable, like the design of international institutions, the design of international payments, international finance, just not our thing, but it's, it's clearly an area we're going to have to broach. 
And then this is the other thing, which is also a little bit uncomfortable, which is where the emissions are rising most quickly is actually in the middle income countries and will soon be in the lower income countries. So it's not like we do the mitigation, you know, off in uh, you know, developed industrialized countries and we do the adaptation in the poorer countries. <laughs> That's not going to work. And I think what Seema was saying is like, when it's just CO2, you can kind of do it anywhere. And we need to think a lot about how to do that. And I'll come to a few ideas on that. And then finally, you know, the stuff comes, the CO2 comes a lot from energy, but it comes from all sorts of areas. So depending on the country, if you're in Brazil and Indonesia, completely different than if you're in uh, the UK or the US. Okay, so on this, I'm, I'm basically sort of convinced that climate change is a major issue of the 21st century. I think we don't have to, but I do think the difference, say, from poverty, it's really a macro-global issue with micro-causes. And this is going to require a lot of new approaches. So I think the first thing that's already come across many, many times so far and will continue to come across is just new types of data, just vast quantities of new types of data. We've heard a lot of satellite stuff, but it's coming from all, all regions. And then this kind of crowding in of methods, and I'll mention a few, from different fields of, of economics is going to be necessary. And I think it's going to become development because it's, going to, it's happening in developing countries. It's always been how we've worked. We're kind of focused on an area rather than a topic or a field. And I think this is going to be a kind of a push for many of us to move into new areas. So I think what I've seen, if you look at Alan Siao or Clara Balboni, you know, they're coming at this using methods, you know, one IO, the other trade. You know, which are different from many of the methods that, it, that, that, we've, that we've been using in this area. And I think the final thing is that this will lead to a kind of mainstreaming of environmental issues into economics and economic policy, which is both necessary but also interesting because it's good to get into new areas. And clearly the, the felt need is great enough that we're going we're gonna to be forced to do that. So in the remaining five, no, ten minutes, nine minutes, of the talk, I just wanted to mention three areas which I think are certainly not exhaustive, but I think they're interesting in the following form that, for one thing, they're, they're using different methods and different types of data, and they're all kind of areas where you're getting both policy interest and you're getting lots of economists who, A, typically would not identify as environmental economists, moving into these areas because they find them interesting. So a lot of people, for example, from IO and energy are moving into the clean energy area. But this is also now a felt need by, by many policymakers for the obvious, the obvious reasons. So this is probably the oldest paper in um, uh, development and environmental economics. It's with Dave over there. And it was started when he was still a PhD student at the LSE, so we're still not. But basically, it's showing that the effects of additional days um, so the same sort of same temperature variation has much more negative effects on mortality in India than, uh, than the U.S. And what's interesting is that those effects are really all coming from rural populations. So I'm now going to kind of drill down into the population that Oriana was describing this morning. And all I'm going to do is to show you, if you get, and I can show you like a little picky of... Um, uh, this is floods on a particular day. So we have this you know, for every 250 meter by 250 meter pixel going back to uh, 2000. If we overlay floods and drought data on the data she was describing, this RCT data between 2011 and 2011, we can ask the obvious question, which is when you have lots of droughts and floods, does having the graduation program make you more, more resilient to those? And this is basically, this is droughts. This is basically the picture. So the treated are the red bars and the blues are the controls. And so you see this big, you know, you're, 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 you get a lot more climate resilience if you've been exposed to the program. So that's one thing that is going to happen more and more. And going back to the Zambia situation, the problem is not only that there's a drought, but it's happening in areas that droughts never happened in before. So it's the kind of unexpected nature of these shocks that is particularly difficult to deal with. So it's happening in areas, it's more severe, um, but this is giving, at least, I'm not saying this is the solution, but this is one way you deal with it by designing social protection problems that are big enough, basically, to encourage some form of occupational change. So in the, in the words of Claire's paper, you're kind of moving people out of harm's way. 
This is just showing on the investment side, so this is for areas that had more shocks between 2000 and 2006 when the evaluation started, what the difference of the effects of treatment and control. And what you see here is if you're in a kind of more shocky area, then you, you have a less of an impact of the program. So you could think of climate change sort of making the world shockier, and here you can see the sort of differences in program effects, which one interpretation might be you have to give more in order to protect people. But I think one core concept that's come through all the work we've been doing with Oriana is that you need something which actually move you into an occupation which is both higher earning, i.e. development protects you from climate change, but also typically less exposed. So for example, livestock rearing, you see less fluctuations than if you're an, if you're an agricultural laborer or a domestic servant. Okay. And finally, I, I, not finally, but almost finally, um, this is obviously in a world where you have very few occupations. You basically, for women, have uh, domestic service, um, uh, livestock, and agricultural labor. We need to think of a world, and this is from some work that Oriana described a bit of, about job variety. And the reason for that is that as we move up GDP per capita, this is the number of jobs accounting for 90% of the workforce, you see GDP per capita. Well, what we don't know the answer to is, is if you have more job variety, does that make you more resilient? And just to show you a very, very beautiful, this is sort of showing for those interested in firms that a lot of that increase in job variety is coming from moving out of self-employment into wage work. This is wage work within firms. Right, so is that going to be one of the principal means by which people protect themselves, is actually working within firms and moving out of these very sort of subsistence type occupations. And then just showing you a kind of picture of what happens across the world, this is a raid by GDP per capita, you see this increase in um, the, the darkness of the bars integrates greater skills, movement out of agriculture and into non-agricultural stuff and into more skilled non-agricultural stuff. So I don't think we want to kind of limit ourselves to this sort of rural situation in Bangladesh. We need to be thinking about how to get people into more sort of specialized jobs where they can express their abilities. Okay, we'll move on a lot to, because um, I don't want to exceed my time, uh, natural capital. And the, the main things I wanted to uh, point out here is just to sort of the value of satellite data, not only to kind of see the destruction of forests and forest fires and so forth, but to actually measure the value of conservation. Uh, the, co uh, the, the core idea I want to sort of get across here, which I'm working on with Alan Xiao and Ben Olkon on, is this is Palm relative to other sources of emissions from his job market paper. And you can see that Palm, at least in the latter period, is exceeding the EU in terms of emissions. That's all in Malaysia and Indonesia. And when you look at where that's coming from, it's actually coming mainly from within the soil, from, from underneath the ground. So what we're working on is this idea that you can grow oil palm in many areas, or do other forms of agricultural production. What if you did some sort of smart conservation where you focused agricultural commodity production in certain areas and then did more protection of the areas that had higher conservation value. Now, higher conservation value might be the things like in Zambia, beautiful game parks that tourists want to visit, higher biodiversity, it could be anything. But I think one of the values of better measurement is you can get much smarter. You don't just have to zone one whole area under a particular protection regime. You can start to think about how to, you know, in the words of SEMA, sort of think about the trade-offs between development and and conservation and be, be better at doing that. Okay, so the final thing, and this will involve a, an astronomic number of uh, uh, maps, is clean energy. And the reason I wanted to raise this, and I guess it's a little bit of uh, kind of hope, is the, the rate at which innovation in clean energy is progressing. So that's the main sort of thing I want to get across. And then to end on how do we think about how that innovation is going to actually diffuse into countries like the ones around here, uh, which I think is going to have to involve lots of intervention. It's not just going to happen automatically, sort of in the form that, say, cell phones uh, happen. So this is the fall in solar prices. And with a whole team, two pre-docs, two PhD students, John Van Rienen, we've kind of formed a solar lab at the LSE where we just got very interested in what happened in China with solar. And I'm going to show you what we've found out so far. 
And the easiest way just to do it with maps, which I love. Uh, so these are not, this is not production of solar, this is patenting in solar in different city regions in China. So you see in 2002, not a lot is happening as we move on through the many maps. 2005, 2006, it's getting darker. And then you start to see the first black bars appearing around the, city, uh, the cities. And those are the cities that are subsidizing solar in some way. They're either doing production subsidies or innovations that encourage R&D, or they're doing demand subsidies such as feed-in tariffs to encourage the production of solar electricity. And going back to a lot of the stuff that Pascaline was talking about, pollution and so on, I'll end up with the kind of benefits, not just in terms of we're getting all these solar panels, but it's also making these Chinese cities cleaner. And I think that's a little bit of a kind of a thing that is coming up now that we're going to need to have electrification of everything in order to clean up cities uh, across the developing world. So continuing with this story, and this is kind of astonishing, as we move through time, this is all patents in solar, so solar patents in China. As we move through time, basically China is now moving towards 90% of the solar patents in the world. So in that short period, by using government subsidies, they're pushing up not just production of solar, but they're also pushing up innovation, and that's leading to the price falling, which we're all uh, benefiting from. And so to finish up, these are just some diff and diff estimates. So you want to think of the little black blobs coming in at different times. We're aligning them in a kind of a sort of difference and difference framework. And we're seeing this very clear and persistent effect of any subsidy on patents, on exports. And this is the sort of, so, so basically, and the, the thing that just sort of come across in the last few days, we're also seeing PM 2.5 fall in the cities, which are patented coming through the demand subsidies. So you're getting both benefits from producing and exporting solar panels. You're also patenting, and other people can use those patents, and pollution is coming down. And then finally, and this is finally, uh, this is from this amazing paper by Mara Guant and others showing what happened in Chile. So Chile is a long country where the top bit, or sorry, the middle bit, the Atacama Desert, is great for the production of solar. And what the government did in the sort of final thing is to connect that wonderful place, which is, has no people, but is very good for production of solar. It builds a transmission line down to Santiago in the... Uh, in, in the south of the country, which is the black line. And the color of the, um, uh, on the map reflects energy prices. So basically what you're seeing is initially solar is very close to being worth nothing. That becomes a little, uh, moves away from dark blue. But the amazing thing is when you build it to the, um, to the, the big population center, the energy prices that everybody faces gets cheaper. And there's even some evidence that that is you know, the big point of the paper is even before you built it, you just announced it, you got all this investment in solar. And this is a really important point that if you want to have renewables move through an economy, you have to be committed to doing the things that, uh, that happen. And it requires a kind of commitment by government. You're going to build the transmission infrastructure and so forth. The final, final slide, and then I will stop, is that there is a little bit of evidence that this is also... Uh, pushing out thermal generation. So it's making the generation of electricity cheaper. And also some recent papers showing that pollution in Santiago is falling. So I think this is, you know, it's, it's a, uh, Chile is not the poorest country in the world, but I think it's a little bit of a kind of a signal of how much can be done when you combine the innovations that are happening in China, which are now being encouraged in the US for the Inflation Reduction Act, the Green New Deal in the EU, but how are we going to think about getting those innovations? They don't all have to be in clean energy. It could be clean water. It could be other things to reduce pollution and make the environment better. But we have to think explicitly about what are the policies that are actually going to allow that to happen uh, in, in um, lower and middle income countries. And there I think we're really in the, in the infancy of figuring that out. So I just sort of throw that out as a sort of a set of ideas that we could, we could all be thinking about. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Robin, for sharing your insights on the impact of climate change on development using different development indicators. Thank you for this.
Um, now, this is the time for uh, discussion. The floor is open for questions, comments, and um, remarks. Uh, now, I heard that this part of the room has been <laughs> left behind. <laughs> so I will start from this, this part of the room. So one, two, um, three, four, five, six, seven. OK, go ahead, please. Start from here. Number one. Climate change as well, and I'm curious what your thoughts are on what my sense of the read on some of the spatial work, quantitative spatial work, for instance, is showing. What seems to me quite small effects of the global impacts of climate change. And I'm curious how that, how you think about that work, what forces it may be missing that may be uh, relevant to build into those models. Let, let us take some more, then can respond. Two. So uh, I liked Seema's framing of like mitigation versus adaptation research, right? And one thing that's clear that, that became clear from looking at all of your slides is that adaptation research is where we are lagging, right? And it's understandable, but it's also the place where I think social scientists and economists need to make more of a contribution, right? And I suspect we're lagging because unlike meteorologists and climate scientists who can model the movement of wind and water, it's much more difficult for us to model the future behavior of humans and how they might adapt, right? So I think um, some uh, invitation for the whole room maybe is that finally we are now at the cusp of seeing people's lives actually being affected. So we don't need to model future behavior and we should be doing a lot more work looking, observing their reactions to what's going on. Sorry, over here. Yeah, thank you very much. Uh, following up on uh, what the last uh, person said, I am looking at it that there's a need for us to begin to rethink our adaptation interventions. Uh, for example, I'm working with some small water farmers in Nigeria, and uh, we provided them with information based on the seasonal climate predictions on when to plant, when not to plant, when it is safe, on the annual basis, free of charge, they're not paying. And we discover at the end of the day that just about 30% of these farmers were the one who followed this information that were provided. Uh, I strongly think some of the issues that are involved are more behavioral, which brings me to what the last person said, the intersection between behavioral science and some of these economic intervention. We discovered at the initial phase that most of them went into planting based on historical experiences and what we call farm peer pressure. After exposing them to this intervention, they still went ahead to plant based on the historical experiences. So I'm thinking there may be a need for us to rethink some of this adaptation intervention, especially among farmers, to be behavioral oriented. Thank you. Okay, I can Yeah, then three in my head. five, are you five? Number five? Four. four. <laughs> okay, four, then. Um, it, it strikes me that you know, on the one hand, we have this growing evidence that the impacts of climate change will be worst felt, the economic impacts in the developing world, and that comes through so clearly. But on the other hand, we have the opportunities that are posed by all of the technological changes that this is prompting, and Robin, that's how you end. And I guess the question for me is how, how to bring these things together when we consider the kind of short and long run impacts that we might expect from all of these rapid changes. Um, and, you know, from, from my perspective, for example, as a policymaker in South Africa, 
South Africa is particularly vulnerable to climate impacts of floods in the southeast, drought in the southwest, We're very worried about that. But we also have arguably the best solar resource in the world, us and, and Namibia. Um, and so when you do the kind of modeling, um, how do you take both of those things into account at, at once? Is this going to be good for South Africa or bad in 50 years' time? Um, and, and how do you use that to prompt the right choices in terms of policy and resource allocation and so on? At the moment, they seem like you, get, you have a lot of work on each, but they're running on almost parallel tracks. Mm. Okay, uh, to avoid um, accumulation of questions, let me give briefly the presenters to make brief remarks in each of those, the previous one. Simon, yeah, I, I won't take all of them. Uh, you know, I, I, I guess, uh, you know, I agree with Mushrik's point that the unfortunate or, you know, the silver lining that climate change has arrived is now we do have, you know, massive events. We can look at how people adapt. Pe some people probably know Dev Patel's job market paper is exactly on that. You know, people are experiencing floods. How are they adapting, uh, et cetera? Um, yeah, I can't even hold two questions in my head, so now I'm... <laughs> um, yeah, in terms of, you know, how to think about the opportunities and the costs, I, I, you know, for me, it's not so unusual to think of those as separate tracks because one is about the impacts of climate change where, you know, South Africa is mostly a price taker on how much the climate is going to change, but then you have this opportunity for a lot of solar that can be used domestically, but, you know, I, like I see these new technologies to capture carbon, you know, that are very energy intensive, you know, be wonderful for low and middle income countries to take advantage of that, where you have solar to fuel something that's, you know, sucking carbon out of the atmosphere to, to you know, simplify it. And so, you know, that's, that's the opportunity where it's your mitigation um, potential. And then there's, you know, that, but the amount of climate change is mostly going to be outside of your control and, and the floods and the droughts are, uh, you know, social protection policy challenge. I'll just say a few words again. I mean, these are these are great points. And on the adaptation point, I mean, I, I take Mushrik's point. And uh, I think to Amit's point, part of the reason I emphasize the, the NAF at all paper is because it is still kind of, you know, model driven and they do think about some GE effects in terms of technology diffusion globally. So I thought of it as a nice middle ground, but it was also one of the recent papers that really takes the empirical evidence seriously. and there still is a very model heavy effort in like modeling climate impacts that I would argue often doesn't take the newer estimates, doesn't put them front and center, let's just say. So I, I think the NOTH is a nice compromise because it is serious in terms of the modeling, but they are finding much larger impacts. So you know, I, I think that the literature is still evolving, but I would say there's really growing consensus on larger impacts, so. Alvin? Um, so maybe going from back to front, the. I mean, the, the situation in Zambia is not a million miles away. Um, and I guess there, the drought is, you know, they're 90% hydro, uh, and they need lots of energy for mining and other things. So basically, and I, don't, I can't remember, like 50% of the people don't have any electricity. So you're talking about just massive new investments, and there probably similar solar potential. So you, you probably need to be just whacking up the, the investments you have in. And there, I guess, you balance the, the, the hydro with the, with the solar. Um, that's, that's the kind of way they're thinking about it. But it, it, in general, and South Africa is obviously an outlier because it, in principle, could sell electricity to Zambia, but it doesn't have enough of its own. It, you know, the, the lack of investment is something which I haven't talked about, but it's a big market failure because at least, I don't know about South Africa, but in Zambia, each new customer loses money for Zesco. So not surprisingly, they're not investing a whole bunch in, uh, in, in distribution. So that's, you know, I think that the renewables getting cheaper is good, particularly in high solar potential or wind or whatever areas, but you need to figure out how to integrate them. And I'm not a, an expert on that, but people who are like Mara Guant say that it's actually the, the reality has always proven to be easier than the, pe the, than the policymakers believed that it was going to be, particularly if you're in places that are used to load shedding because you, know, you, can, you can integrate renewables if you use them. On the point of adaptation, I agree. I, I also think there's a kind of more general point that we don't want to lose sight of poverty, which, of course, 
uh, pushed us on for many, many years and continues to push us on because poverty is sort of the thing that brings mitigation adaptation together. But, you know, the, the, the immediate threat, say in Bangladesh, will be more of an adaptation threat. But I think we should also be, always be, I find it quite confusing, the adaptation mitigation. Thing. I prefer to kind of come back to the metric of human welfare and see what, so maybe like going back to the health discussion, maybe a cleaner city adds utility, and maybe that's helped by sort of things that also do mitigation. But, um, and then finally on the growth effects, I mean, I agree with Ted that the more you see, and it depends what you write down as climate change, you start to include particulate pollution and all that stuff. It, the, the estimates really get like, uh, you know, really, really high. So I think, you know, that, and, and that some of them are indirect, you know, you have poor sanitation when it's, you know, at certain times or when it, so I think adding them up is tricky, but the way I see it is the more evidence we get, the worse it looks. And I guess we f f missed one question and, um, you know, and I, I guess 30% technology adoption seems pretty good for, you know, to me. And so I think this is probably another example where uh, without the lens of climate change, there have been a lot of work on technology adoption. Tavneet's in the room and, and Chris is in the room. And so, you know, probably it's, it's not that we need a completely new approach. It's that the problem is really challenging and these behavioral insights and other insights on how to improve technology adoption are, are really needed to, you know, go from 30% uh, to 100 percent. So, you know, I, I don't I don't know what you had in mind as a different strategy. I guess I took away from your story that like, yeah, this is a hard problem. People have been struggling with it in other domains about technology adoption and agriculture and, you know, drawing on those insights and adding new insights on, you know, behavioral bar barriers to technology adoption seems like, you know, a really important area for research. Okay, back to the floor, number five. <laughs> That's I don't know if my question is still relevant because <laughs> the back and forth has addressed some of my latent concerns. Um, as much as we have um, this concerns of um, changes in climate affecting economic growth, I try and look at the flip side because when I listened to Robin, I, I was beginning to get excited because looking at the environmental Kuznet hypothesis, that's the flip side, where economic growth actually affects um, climate or the environment, and then eventually we expect that um, preferences for cleaner environments will emerge because of increase in economic growth. And I think that's the story of China, where they are, they are polluting the world and also looking for the solutions through the innovations of um, clean technologies. Um, through the solar system and all that. So I don't know, and I was like, okay, is that, is that the right way to go? Is the EKC hypothesis, is it consistent in this case? Um, does it apply to the, it looks like to me it applies to the Chinese case, and then if it's good, okay, then the issue of technology adoption and diffusion is it the next way to go? Those are just some um, thoughts that I'm just thinking aloud. Thank yeah. you. Number six, over here. Thank you. Thank you for the great presentations. My question is to Ted. I was very uh, surprised by the figure you showed us with the hum shape relationship between uh, sensitivity to temperature. Great, um, uh, uh, change in, uh, in growth. And what seemed surprising to me is that this hasn't shifted over time, and yet production technology has changed fundamentally the importance of the digital economy. So what do you make of that? How do you explain the fact that it hasn't uh, uh, changed? I don't know if I can... Oh, I think there's... Oh, is there another question? Too? Sorry, sorry, sorry. Yeah, yeah. My Let us finish. Um, last seven. Number seven. Oh. Over there. Yeah, thank you. My, my name is Njerimano Mwapo from uh, University of Nairobi. My question is to Tend. Now, referring to the same figure, uh, question number one, those results are based on IV results. No, uh, 
those no. are just yeah. no diarrhea results. Yeah. Okay, so I, I take Only away the that. the first paper used IV and then oh, we, fine. we, we okay. moved on. Oh, fine, so I take away that one, the second <laughs> one. So you, you, and this is based from, this is from history. Uh, now, um, so in your case, um, the effect of climate change is driving down, let's say, uh, well being. Mm -hmm. Um, so people are not able to adapt, and there is not uh, much of mitigation. Is that is that so? Now, now okay. So from history, that that was the Malthusian idea also with respect to population and food. But actually, people found a way out. Is it not possible that uh, since it's people causing climate change? They will actually find a way of getting out of the problem that you show. Thank you very much. Okay, the last chance, Stephen. Uh, please get Mike here. So, so, so thank you for these um, great presentations. Um, um, I think it was Chris Udry earlier that was telling us, you know, we need, we need stories. We need to be able to tell what do we now know. And the problem is the more we know, the harder the story is to tell. And I just want to get your reaction to, to, to the following. And it, um, you know, I'm always very interested in what, how do I convince a policymaker to take something seriously? And I would like to take them to take Africa and what's going on there seriously. Now, the, the evidence that you present makes it a bit harder. So, so if you think once you move beyond Nordhaus, like Ted was doing, you have big growth effects. You say, oh, this is the growth story. The world is the, it's the, it's the world's growth story. Um, and then, um, you know, once we are, you know, Robin was kind of suggesting maybe we have to move beyond what uh, Sima, you were saying in terms of, uh, you know, climate aid, we have to be careful with it. You know, well, in the end, it's there. The problem is now a bit with the evidence. If the impacts are not very big in rich countries, you know, you're going to get, you get responses and saying, well, you know, it's not really our problem. It's no urgency to it. The second one is that the burden is, of course, now pushed to the developing countries, but the burden of mitigation is then being pushed, as we see it in a lot of negotiations and so on, onto, um, you know, as, uh, on, onto Asian countries, really. And Nick Stern would say the future of the world is going to be determined. What's going to happen with the transitions with energy and infrastructure in the fast-growing Asian economies? So, meanwhile, we sat early, earlier, whether it's health problems, poverty problem, that's largely concentrated in lots of African countries, fragile places. So, so what's the story to tell here now? The evidence gets more complicated, but there is a risk with the evidence, I think, that actually it becomes less urgent for the richer countries and definitely the whole African setting becomes less important. I have no answer, but I would love you to have an answer. <laughs> Thank you very much. Now. Uh I think I'm going to let kind everybody take, except I'll say one thing on yeah. Stefan's, which is, um, you know, I think that same graph in levels would maybe be more compelling for your story, which is, you know, in, in growth rates, yes, the effect might be smaller in the U.S. than it is in South Africa, but in levels, it's still much bigger in the U.S. And, you know, in terms of the amount of, of you know, billions of dollars of GDP, uh, like the, the spillover benefit to sub-Saharan Africa, you know, like there are lots of whatever... Trump's social cost of carbon is, there's still some opportunities, you know, that's just a selfish US focused uh, social cost of carbon, you know, there's still opportunities. And so there you don't need altruism. Obviously to like truly solve the problem, you need some altruism uh, as well. But I do think there are large private benefits and levels. There's so many great questions. You go ahead, Robin. <laughs> <laughs> um, I guess the, the, the big one, which Stefan raised and then various other ones, is that it depends a little bit on, I think, what you're call, calling altruism. I, do we feel any compunction to, to, to redress the damages that have been, been, been caused? And I think that that is a felt 
need of some, certainly the international institutions to some extent, certainly some of the philanthropists. The problem to a large extent is, which is why I po pointed to sort of the international problem, is how do you aggregate that money? And then even more importantly, how do you spend it when you come into a country? Like what's the best use of that money? I think that's where we don't know and why you know, more micro stuff is gonna be useful if you can find that something's very effective. So that's one side of things, that's more on the aid side. But I think there is, you know, like poverty, I mean, you can make some case that colonialism caused poverty, but this is like a direct, <laughs> you know, we shovel the stuff into the atmosphere, it's now affecting, you know, that's a huge, you start to think about that in any kind of legalistic moral framework, it's pretty indefensible <laughs> not to do anything. That's one side. The other side is that there are areas, and that's why I put clean energy last, where innovations are meaning that you can have growth um, whilst also being a lot cleaner. And I think we just, you know, when I said the felt need of dealing with climate change is there for PhD students at LSE, it's there for people in firms, it's there for people in all sorts of science there, it's there in the youth population. And so that's just, I mean, I think the, the core message I want to kind of get across was that Without climate change, we wouldn't have this enormous yearning to innovate in a whole bunch of areas, not just in technology, but also in things like social protection that Mushfiq was bringing up, in you know, how you manage the natural environment that Seema was bringing up. I just don't think, you know, we just be a forest, we cut down, we cut all the forests down in the UK, it's not a problem. And now there's this implication of cutting down the forest in Africa or Amazon or Indonesia that really <coughs> matters for the whole world. So how we balance that is, is, is tricky. I, I, I'm just saying that there's, there's, a, there's a positive, innovative force in the world now that didn't exist without climate change. And I think that might actually end up being quite a big positive deal for the world if we come up with the right innovation. It might actually be better and have cleaner cities. We might have better uh, transportation and so forth. But I mean, that's the, I guess the hopeful uh, side of things. I'll just yep, have one do. last response, and I'm just mm. building on Robin's point. I mean, to, to Germano's point that, um, you know, maybe we should have hope, and maybe we will be able to innovate out of the solution, and maybe the next few years. We saw that figure of the price of solar panels, and there were just episodes of just massive reductions in innovation. So maybe we'll see several of those in a way we haven't in the past. So I don't want to say I'm too pessimistic about it. it. Just historically, there has been this relationship, and again, just in a note of humility, I think it's hard to understand why it's so fixed. We had looked at this 10 years ago, we've looked at it recently, and there's just this very similar relationship, and others have found it as well. That kind of inverted U just looks very similar. I'm not sure why, but we have to do more research, and I think we're, we're at that stage. Uh, yeah. yeah, thank you very much. Uh, so this session, we have great presentation by Sima, followed by great interventions by two respondents. Please give them a round of applause. So, yes, thank you very much. There is an um, announcement. Uh, as you can see in the program, there's a public lecture. The transport is arranged that takes you from here to the Stonebush University. Please, you can get the bus over there. Thank you very much.